Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Marcel Timber, Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, San Francisco Market Executive, member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and your chair for today's program. The Commonwealth Club has, of course, shifted from in-person programs to virtual events, and we are grateful for the support of our viewers. We appreciate your considering donating to the club, and if you wish to do so, please text the word DONATE, that's D-O-N-A-T-E, DONATE, to 415-329-4231, or visit the club's website at thecommonwealthclub.org. We also want to remind you to submit questions for our guests via the chat room next to your screen, and later in the program, our moderator will get to as many questions as possible. Today, we are pleased to present the Walter Hoadley annual economic forecast, named in honor of the club's late past president and longtime board member, Dr. Walter Hoadley. Dr. Hoadley also served most notably as chief economist and vice president of the Bank of America. Today's program will be sponsored by the Walter E. Hoadley Memorial Fund and Bank of America. Our program will feature two distinguished speakers with distinct viewpoints. Dr. Michael Boskin, Professor of Economics and Senior Fellow at Stanford University Hoover Institution, who also chaired President George H.W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. And Dr. Laura Tyson, Professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, who chaired President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. Let me say a bit more about each. Dr. Boskin served at the ch as the chairman of the President George W. George H. W. Bush Council of Economic Advisors from 1989 to 1993. He has advised four presidents of the United States, multiple prime ministers of the United Kingdom, chancellors of Germany, and premiers of China. He also chaired the highly influential Blue Ribbon Commission on the Consumer Price Index whose report has transformed the way government statistical agencies around the world measure inflation, GDP, and productivity. Dr. Boskin is also president of the Corrett Foundation and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Dr. Laura Tyson is an influential scholar of economics and public policy and an expert on trade and competitiveness, who has also served as a presidential advisor. Dr. Tyson was a member of President Clinton's cabinet between 1993 and 1996, serving as chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and the White House National Economic Council. She was the first woman to serve in those positions. In addition to her work at the Haas School, Dr. Tyson also chairs the Board of Trustees and UC Berkeley's Bloom Center for Developing Economies, which aims to develop solutions to global poverty. Today, Dr. Boskin and Dr. Tyson will be in conversation with Evelyn Dilsaver, Chair of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, former Executive Vice President of Charles Schwab, and former President and CEO of Charles Schwab Investments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Boskin, Dr. Laura Tyson, and Evelyn Dilsaver. You know, um, every president assumes office with a crisis in hand, but uh, in this one we'll have to probably say nobody's ever assumed it with maybe four or five crises at the same time, with COVID and the vaccine um, distribution as being ineffective, our economic devastation, especially with the small businesses, uh, 10 million fewer Americans employed than before COVID, and two-thirds of our children cannot attend school in person. I would love to hear from um, first Michael and then um, Dr. Laura, your perspective on a president coming in to that kind of a setting 
And one other caveat, most presidents only have 100 days to get something done before then they run into the buzzsaw. So if you were to give him advice today, what advice would you give him to try to accomplish in those first 100 days? Well, let me just start by saying that generally a when, when there's a party change in who's elected, they've been running against uh, the previous president and what uh, he or maybe eventually she uh, has done. Uh, they focus on what are perceived to be the weaknesses at targeting the voters they think they can get. Uh, and then they have many uh, uh, pronouncements uh, of things they're going to do, generally uh, hyperbolic uh, to some extent. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, Joe Biden, who was the, the quote, moderate, a center left uh, candidate in the Democratic field, offended off uh, the so-called progressives. Uh, I'm not sure I would, what they want to accomplish, I would call for progress, but in any event, fended them off. But he made a variety of accommodations with them. Most of his policies move to oversimplify halfway to what, uh, to some of their more extreme policies. Uh, and so he, he did that and retained some strong unity in addition to uh, some voters voting because they didn't want another four years of Trump, even if they didn't particularly care for the policies he was proposing. So he has to deal with that. He has to deal with a closely divided Congress uh, and yeah. uh, evenly split Senate, although uh, Kamala Harris will be able to cast a tie-breaking vote in 50-50 votes be able to get some things passed uh, with 51 votes through budget reconciliation if he chooses to go that route. But there are a variety of ways he could work with Republicans on a variety of things uh, that might have him settle for uh, partial victories, but uh, but victories rather than having things blocked and, uh, and debated for a long time and never passed. Um, I think uh, Laura served with President Clinton, who did an admirable job of that in 1995, 96, 97, working with Republicans in the Congress to uh, reform welfare and to balance the budget. So that would be my advice to him. I don't know that he'll take it. He has this delicate political act to deal with, with the left side of his party. But I think it's also important to understand where we are, how we got here, and what to do about it. Uh, we have an unprecedented economic situation brought on by uh, once in a century. Hopefully, it'll be another century before we have anything like this again. Maybe not. Uh, pandemic. Uh, and... Uh, we had a very, very sharp downturn. Uh, the downturn was brief, but extremely sharp. There was a partial rapid rebound that's, that slowed uh, late in the third quarter through the fourth quarter of this year, but still was fairly substantial. Uh, we have difficulties in figuring that out. Uh, for example, the New York Fed believes the fourth quarter, with the data we now have grew at, ending in December, grew at 2.5%. The Atlanta Fed thinks it was 7%. So there's a lot of confusion about exactly what has happened. There's optimism about the future. I think as a base case, it's fairly well taken, but you know that doesn't mean something else bad could happen that disrupt things independent of the evolution of the virus uh, and the response to it. But the economy is intimately intertwined with the evolution of the virus and, and the economic policy and public health response. We've had a massive stimulus uh, both from a monetary and fiscal side. We'll probably get an additional stimulus, I think probably less than President Biden would like and hopefully more carefully targeted uh, to those really in need. Um, but also the recovery has been very, the, the hit was very uneven and the recovery has been very uneven, hitting particularly low wage workers in service industries and in retail and travel and leisure and hospitality and things of that sort. People who finally late in the last expansion, 26, 7, 8, 9, actually saw their wages grow more rapidly than the general population and things pick up for them with very low unemployment. Um, so there's, a, there's optimism in my view warranted for the second half of this year uh, and perhaps late in the spring uh, if, the if the virus vaccinations go according to plan. Uh, we have problems in the rest of the world which is lagging behind us. They've had a larger hit to their GDPs uh, the, most of the developing world and Europe, and, for example, uh, China has recovered a bit, uh, growing very slowly, if you believe the data, and Taiwan and South Korea didn't, uh, weren't hit nearly as hard and are recovering. But in general, the Europeans are lagging behind us in the virus uh, rollout, uh, the virus vaccine rollout, because they relied heavily on 
They wanted to rely on European vaccines from AstraZeneca and Sanofi. And so their, their ability to vaccinate the bulk of high-risk groups and the bulk of the general population is lagging a quarter or two behind ours. So that's late in the year rather than in mid-year. Uh, so that's going to be a problem in, our, uh, in, in the rest of the world and the pressures that creates in a variety of ways. Um, and then we have a variety of structural issues in the economy that some of which were revealed and heightened by the COVID crisis. Uh, for example, um, we've it revealed that a lot of family, more families than I think most people realized, were living quite hand to mouth and had very few reserves even to be able to weather uh, three months of, uh, of disruption. Uh, the capacity of government, but especially state and local governments, and sadly, perhaps almost worse, California, to actually do and exercise its most core responsibilities. You know, we have a misnamed employment development department that still has 800,000 backlog uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance, which is 10 months after COVID. Two or three months, obviously, it takes some time to gear up, but it's just remarkable. And there are many other examples, including our poor, poor rollout. There will be a lot of issues that will have to be dealt with, an education deficit from kids who have been out of school, whether they can catch up where they would naturally or whether we can help them catch up, fiscal deficits, which were already a big problem prior to COVID. Um, President Obama ran the largest uh, full employment budget deficits of any administration since World War II until President Trump, who managed to top that in an even stronger economy. And then, um, you know, we've added a lot of debt now, and I think much of it was, was well-designed to try to have on a humanitarian and to some extent economic basis, try to weather uh, this crisis and bridge the other side, as many have said. Um, we'll have the future of work to deal with. Uh, we'll have to um, uh, especially deal with policy exits by the Fed and the, and the federal government at some point uh, to get back to some normalcy. I don't think that's in the cards in the short run, but uh, I think uh, in a year or so, people are going to have to turn their attention to sensible policies to do that. And the, the timing and the pace and the nature of that will really be a very large part of how the economy does in 2022 and three. Uh, but for right now, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about later this year. Great. Thank you, Dr. Boskin. Dr. Tyson, your comments? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Me. I feel like I must start here. I'll start with a general statement that there is much that Michael has said that I completely agree with. We had a strong U.S. economy going into the COVID recession. We had a, a remarkable, unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus, which helped us uh, have a partial recovery into the fall of 2020. Then we saw that the recovery started to falter. And uh, that led to the second stimulus, the 900 billion that has been passed, and to now a proposal of an additional almost $2 trillion of emergency rescue. Uh, I want to emphasize the importance of those policies and emphasize the emergency rescue nature of this, um, because this was a very uneven uh, recession nothing like it in the past. This was not a recession that started in manufacturing. This started in services. Then you look within services, you see a tremendous number of low wage workers in the service industries that were hit. And related to service, you sort of see the small business restaurants, all those small businesses that were actually involved in producing products and services for uh, much of the workforce that was going into the urban centers to those office buildings. All that's gone. It's, it, it. And one of the questions is going to be, does it come back? So anyway, there was a very uneven nature. We called it, Lenny Mendonca and I called it in work we did, it was a dual recession, at least a dual recession. Some people call it a K-shaped a recession. The actual, the bottom fell the top didn't fall. It actually stayed level and went up. Okay, so um, we, so I, I want to say again, think about this: the emergency nature when you think about well, what do we need to spend money on? What do we need to continue government spending on? Unemployment insurance, uh, small business lending (PPP), uh, and I'll talk about the state in a minute about that. Um, we need to help 
state and local governments. And this is actually where the Congress starts to divide. How can you have a national coordinated distribution plan for the vaccine without support for state and local governments? You can't, you can't, they can't do it. They don't have the capacity to do it. So I really wanna emphasize a very important part of what the Biden administration is doing right at the beginning is to say, we have this massive plan to distribute the vaccine, to actually make sure we don't have any production shortfall. So we will rely upon the possibility of using the Defense Production Act if we have to, okay? We got to deal with production, but distribution, that takes resources, that takes help to state and local governments. And that will be, that's been controversial. I, I'm surprised, but, but, but so you said, what would I think the Biden administration should do? I think they're going I, th I look at the stimulus package. I agree with Michael that maybe a, a little bit better targeting of some of this could be helpful. But the bulk of the money is related to this uh, dual recession and to the emergency of getting uh, the COVID under control. And the outlook for the second half of 2021 depends completely on getting the distribution of the vaccine right. I mean, otherwise it won't, it won't happen. That wonderful recovery, which is sitting there waiting to happen, if you can unleash the economy from the lockdowns, won't happen. Um, let me say a couple other things about what where I, I disagree with Michael. Uh, I think he's very unfair to the state of California. I, I cannot, I absolutely, yes, the state of California has had a significant problem and it recognizes it with its employment development division. I, I, it recognizes it. It is doing whatever it can to, and that will be, but think about this. California went into the system with a very significant reserve very healthy fiscal situation, very healthy fiscal situation. California has unleashed, I've been part of, a massive set of grants and, and small business loan facilities. We are trying and I think successfully rolling out to much of the small business community access to capital, which is essential for them to survive. So I, I just, and I could talk about other things. I could talk about the minimum wage and EITC in California. I could talk about the fact that California, run, you know, we are running the biggest Medicaid establishment in the country, in the country. And we are doing it efficiently. Cal Covered California is working for millions of Californians. So I just feel it's unfair to hit the state hard. And I, I just want to start with that difference. Um, i talk a little bit about the future because this is an area where Michael and I could possibly disagree. I was struck by some recent numbers I saw, public opinion polls. This was one that was done by uh, for a, a presentation, I think, at a J.P. Morgan event. There's been significant increase among Americans in their expectations of the role of government. Okay, so if you look at the situation in 2010, uh, in the middle of the global recession, the re uh, and you look now, good heavens, almost half of Americans think the government should be doing more to solve problems. Almost half. Almost half of young Americans think that capitalism is a problem and socialism isn't a problem. Um, almost half think that business should be more regulated, not less regulated. So I, I just want to say that when we're thinking about policy, let's think about the fact that people want, expect more from their government now. They expect more from the public health delivery system. They expect more from uh, the infrastructure, an area that probably Michael and I agree upon. Um, Democrats and Republicans have always disagreed on the size of government. And I just want to say that these polls are suggesting that most Americans think, you know, it's not, we want, a, we want high quality government. We want government to solve services. We are not so fixated anymore on just keeping government small. Government's not the problem. It's not the problem. So let me, let me stop there as a way to suggest possible areas of, oh, I'll, I'll say one other thing related to this because Again, both Michael and I, macroeconomists at heart, there is a debate among economists about what economists are now calling fiscal space. How much space does the federal government have? Because this, at the state level, it's their balanced budget constraints, so we can't talk about fiscal constraints. 
at the at the level of the federal government, some people, many economists are saying we have a huge amount of fiscal space. We can run these larger deficits. We can run this larger debt because the real interest rates are negative. They're negative. Okay, it's better to borrow now <laughs> and pay back later. Um, and uh, we should use that fiscal space both to invest in our future, that's the infrastructure, education, healthcare argument, and in the short run, to create enough fiscal stimulus to get us out of this recession uh, and, and vaccinated so we can get out of it for good. So we could debate the size of the fiscal space, but it's interesting to me that Americans in general think Right now, more government is probably something desirable. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear from you, Dr. Boskin, about I'd those make a two. Few comments. Um, Laura stated her case well, as usual. Uh, I view the fact that so many young people think there's, uh, prefer socialism to capitalism a problem in our education system, uh, which also is a state and local responsibility. That's number one. Um, number two, uh, anybody who thinks that California and its cities are well run should walk down the street in San Francisco or Los Angeles. Uh, we have lots of problems. The problems are immense. What, what we've done thus far to deal with, with many of them, homelessness, for example, hasn't worked. Uh, perhaps some of it has been counterproductive. Uh, I could go on and on uh, with respect to the uh, EDD and other uh, failures the state this isn't just something that's that's at uh, the current governor and legislature's uh, doorstep it's gone on for a long time we've greatly underinvested we've underinvested the structure of yeah, government. Agree. computer systems for example and technical capability uh, i agree <laughs> so there's just an, an immense set of those things mm -hmm. um, also um while you might believe that the, as laura believes that the state EITC and all these things have, uh, you know, done fabulously well. They're modest in size compared to uh, the federal government intervention. And on the fiscal space issue, I've written extensively on this. This is not going to end well. Um, there, mm -hmm. I totally agree that right now there is not a fiscal capacity problem in the short run. So I support borrowing to make sensible spending decisions now. But every dollar of that that isn't sensible that doesn't have much of an effect to improve the economy or to greatly cushion people who are in desperate need, whether that's business owner, you know, small business owners or workers who are unemployed or whatever it happens to be, uh, is something that's going to be have to be dealt with later. And everyone's saying, well, interest rates are really low, they're going to stay low. Well, to give you an example of how poorly economists, uh, <laughs> private and private markets forecast right. interest rates. In the last crisis, when the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to zero, they were expected to stay there for nine months. They stayed there for seven years. So I just think yep. kind of a sensible risk management would say, we need to be a little cautious about telling our politicians, there's a free lunch, spend away, borrow all you want, the Fed will buy all the bonds, and there'll never be any reckoning. Well, the Federal, Federal Reserve buying all the bonds is just a way of avoiding the government sending it straight to the banks because it winds up in the excess reserves in the banks. So I can go on and on in this matter. <laughs> that's my only point. That's my only point. And the better we start thinking about that uh, sometime this year, about how we come out of this a year or two later, than uh, just pretend that it won't happen and just hope in a run for luck that nothing ever happens. Well, somebody else will have to pay for it on someone else's watch. And the last thing I would say is many of the same economists that Laura has been referring to say that the capacity of the economy is very, very modest. And that growth is going to be low for a long time because of all sorts of reasons they give. Okay, That may or may not be right. Only time will tell. But it also suggests mm. that if the growth of the economy is going to be low, each generation is going to be only a little bit wealthier than the one that preceded it. And therefore, piling on debt to them in the future that they're going to have to wind up repaying uh, is going to be less and less equitable in their generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just FYI, a word of caution about running wild on debt. Um, so, so the um, Americans have saved 1.6 trillion in excess savings, at least as of mid-December. What happens to our economy when they start to unleash that and spend it from an inflation point of view, if anything? Well, I think inflation, inflation expectations are uh, 
somewhat subdued right now. That doesn't mean I mean, they've changed quickly, you know, what macroeconomists call regime change <laughs> in the past and could again. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is there's a pent-up demand for lots. People haven't been able to spend on lots of things. You yep. haven't been able to have a meal in a restaurant with your friends, for example, mm-hmm. or a movie theater. Uh, safely or to get on an airplane and travel to Europe, for example, without having to worry about all the problems there and then coming back and having to quarantine. So there's a pent-up demand that that for uh, for a little bit of time, uh, you know, in a couple of quarters would probably be good for the economy. But we do have to pay attention that the one thing that could cause the Fed to change its mind fairly abruptly about um, raising interest rates sooner than people expect right now would be an unexpected increase in inflation and inflation expectations. I'm not predicting that. I don't think it's in the cards this year, but it is something that someone should have, we should have to pay attention to and keep an eye on is all I'm saying. And I'm sure Jay Powell will. Yeah. Dr. Tyson. Yep. I, I, so I know that Jay Powell will. I know that the Federal Reserve Board will. I know that there's a large amount of uncertainty about uh Inflation, certainly in the medium term, I don't think there's much in the, sh- in the short term in the next few years, the next couple of years. I think the same is true of interest rates. Um, I do agree with Michael. I mean, one of the things that no one uh, predicted, my, my, the economist profession did not predict the trend in interest rates for at least the last decade. So basically, we better keep that in mind because the trend could change in an unpredictable way. Um, so I, I, I want to emphasize that. I, I will go back to your question of savings. I want to go back to the dual nature of what we have been living through because mm-hmm. those savings are building up in the top, say, 40% of the, of the income distribution, not in the bottom 60%. Essentially, if you look at things like what happened to the cash stimulus payments that have been made already? What happened to the unemployment compensation payments that were made? If you were in the bottom 20% or the bottom 40%, those were consumed. Those were spent because you know what? You had, these are our necessities. They're not taking those trips to restaurants. They're not taking those vacations. They're not going to the stadium for a big sporting event. They're necessities. Okay. So now we, we could very well see that the, there's going to be an unleashing of some of the savings on demand. I would look to patterns of demand. What sectors? What sectors? What Are these going to be a lot of luxury goods? Are they going to be on a lot of luxury trips? I actually am worried. Uh, let's go to transportation. The, 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 the airlines have had to really reduce their capacity dramatically. What happens if all of a sudden you get this, uh, people feel okay about jumping back on planes. There's, I, boy, the capacity constraints short term, and maybe the pricing, the pricing that results from that. Could, so I think we got to look at who has the savings, what are they likely to consume, and, uh, and think again about the, the dual nature of the relief here in the short run, it seems to me, again, I would say we've got to help state and local governments get the vaccine distribution done. We've got to worry about small businesses through the PPP. And uh, in California, we have these great grant and loan programs through loans. We have to help people who are can't get a job with unemployment compensation. Mm-hmm. The, the cash assistance checks, I think we have to, I think we have to think about the targeting of those. But now let's go to the next range of things. Let's think there, there's a Biden agenda here, which is longer term. That, 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 that emergency relief is not really the build back better. The build back better is infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the build back better is uh, climate policy. It's green infrastructure. It's climate change and what we do about that. And I think... And what can we do to enhance our uh, training and skill development and education system? Usually what the federal government there is they work with the states. They're not running the, the programs themselves, but we have seen a lot now of programs. We've learned more and more about skill development programs that do work. And I and and uh, President Biden is committed to providing more federal funding for that. So build back better 
in the future. Um, but those things all cost money. They are investments. They are more spending. And then the question becomes, do, does the U.S. government have the fiscal space? I believe it does. I believe it does. But the issue of keeping that question in mind is a very important. Uh, you know, there was an interesting, I just want to point out, a very unlikely group of economists agreeing. And uh, this was, and I know because I work with all of them. So Bob Rubin, Peter Orzag, and Joe Stiglitz. You cannot think of a combination <laughs> like that, okay? They just did a really interesting paper. Well, on the left side of the spectrum, sure. <laughs> on the right side of the spectrum, they wouldn't agree with any of them. <laughs> well, Bob Rubin, Bob Rubin and Joe Stiglitz is like, I think, a pretty broad space. Yeah, uh, anyway, all I would say is that they, they came up with some really interesting things to think about going forward in fiscal policy, which is we really need to do much better with automatic stabilizers. So we link much more of our relief when it's rescue or emergency to the state of the economy. You could even do that with infrastructure plans. You could make them contingent in a way so they're not they're counter cyclical as opposed to pro cyclical. So I think we've got to think about uh, how we're going to make fiscal policy. Maybe there's a va- maybe there is a value. I personally have always thought there might be a value to taking at least the infrastructure budget and making that a capital budget, taken out of the operational budget of yep. the government. So, yep. but we're going to have to worry about those kinds of things. Absolutely. Great. Let's turn global for a second. We turn global. Just quickly and, respond to sure. a couple of things about that. So the, the, the nation and California certainly have infrastructure needs. Some of those are appropriately governmental. Many are better for private. For example, we have a massive cell phone infrastructure that is handled privately much more efficiently than the government would ever do it. Uh, we have uh, some of that is appropriately federal, some of it appropriately state and local. But we've seen a lot of infrastructure spending that's very poorly targeted and does poorly. California launched an idiotic, ex-ante idiotic, uh, so-called high-speed rail program that wound up becoming unfundable at three or four times the cost originally projected and, and perhaps even distorted to the voters who approved the original bonds. And it's now mixed-speed rail because it doesn't, it's using a lot of existing rail if it ever gets funded. Mr. Biden wants a, a national network of those. There's probably a, in the Northeast quarter, maybe dense enough traffic that makes sense. But uh, so we have to be careful about just calling something infrastructure without doing a real careful, uh, a real careful cost benefit analysis when it makes sense. Because the high speed rail project thus far has been a negative return, not even zero return. Mm-hmm. Uh, can we turn global for a second? What do you think is the outlook for trade policy in the, in the coming year and the residual impact of Trump's uh, previous trade policies? Laura, you want to start that discussion amongst other things? Well, uh, first of all, I guess I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I would say that the evidence which was there before us is uh, continues to, I think these trends will continue. We have had before COVID, we had a slowdown in global trade relative to global output. So that very heady period of uh, trade growing two, three times as fast as global GDP. I don't think so anymore. Um, we've also seen a shift in the growth dynamics of trade to Asia. So much more South-South or inter-Asia trade going on. Um, we've seen um, more, more near shoring going on. So a lot of firms have gotten concerned and COVID underscored these concerns. Um, they didn't have resilient supply chains. They were too concentrated. They, they, they were too. They were relying on a few suppliers, very concentrated in a few areas. They've decided they need to diversify that. Um, so there'll be different patterns of of trade. I think on uh, U.S. trade relations, I would say the following. The U.S. is very intent. I know this. Uh, uh, Biden, the Biden administration has been very clear about this. They would very much like to have uh, a trade negotiations going on with, I would think we would call it like-minded market trading nations, and that means primarily with Europe. Um, So I think there will be trade negotiations going on. I think that, um, 
you heard President Biden already indicate that there are bipartisan, still significant bipartisan concerns about trade with China. So I, I just think that I, I guess my sense is that the patterns that exist in pre-COVID have not been fundamentally changed. They've been reinforced, and all of those things are are reinforced. Um, the China dilemma f- for the United States is that um, you know we we still have uh, many of our companies have significant investments in China and they sell significant amounts of what they produce in China. Those are major markets for China. Much of what China exports to us comes from quasi quasi for quasi private firms where if you look at the underlying structure the underlying structure oftentimes has a foreign firm and a US firm involved. Okay? So, um so I think that we have huge economic interests in getting trade with China right and trying to get it on a sounder path than it has been on uh, under the Trump administration. But this will be a massive uh, negotiating um, challenge. Uh, and I think, and finally, I'm going to end on a positive note here. I think that to go back to climate, I think that um, there's a real possibility here. U.S. rejoining Paris, uh, a lot of the discussions around climate have to do with trade and what we should, what should be the case uh, for dealing with uh, carbon intensive products as they move across borders. This is an area where actually, and, and also on research and development in carbon, these are areas where I actually think we can work a lot with China. If you go back to the history of the of the Paris Agreement, it was first an agreement between the U.S. and China on climate that led to the unleashing of that agreement. So I'm optimistic that we can find a way back to a healthier relationship with China, both on trade and on climate. So I will stop there. And my views are uh, partially... Uh congruent with Laura's on the trends, many of which go back prior to Trump, although everybody focuses on the Trump tariffs and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. getting hard. I think that uh, one of the big mistakes that President Trump made uh, policy-wise, I think he was wise to draw attention to China and to confront some of China's abuses. But I think he should have worked with our European allies, for example, forming mm-hmm. and forming so on. I think that was something that didn't, uh, didn't happen, unfortunately. I do think it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, the global economy's changed a lot, and countries that were very poor a long time ago aren't so poor now. Uh, China's GDP has quadrupled since it joined the World Trade Organization. If you go back to why NAFTA occurred, I was involved with that. We wanted to help the reformers and unleash prosperity in our southern border for many reasons, including some on the far right we were worried about more mass immigration, but just in general that we thought we'd have a healthier hemisphere with a more prosperous Mexico. Uh, And I think the gains from trade were there. Some people were hurt by it, et cetera. There were changes made in the USMCA, you can argue. I think in general, they were not large changes. Uh, Going back to China, though, when they were brought into the World Trade Organization, the going in thought by economists and policymakers was well, if we help them, they will gradually adhere to the WTO rules. It won't happen overnight. And they won't be transformed necessarily into a parliamentary democracy like, uh, like Canada or a free, totally free market economy. It will accelerate that trend. And that will also have geopolitic, politi- internal political benefits in China and geopolitical benefits. And it turns out that uh, that worked for a little bit of a while when Zhu Rongji was premier, for example, mm-hmm. especially. It, it stalled when Wen Xiaobao and Hu Jintao came to power. And President Xi basically has uh, has reversed that. And so I think that's why we have so many uh, different constituencies focused on different issues from human rights to defense, to trade abuse, to, uh, you know, to many other issues, uh, forming a, 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 uh, a constituency to get tough on China that uh, has little to do with Trump, that some people like what he did, some people don't, some of it worked, some of it didn't, et cetera. So the question how to manage that relationship 
<laughs> including on climate. So, so in 2015, the Paris Climate Accords, yes, it occurred, but it gave China a 15 year pass. And of course, there's no guarantee in 2030 that they'll show up and say, okay, now we're going to abide by what we agreed to. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there are, they're doing some things, uh, but they're still generating a lot of coal. They've become by far the largest emitter uh, and the like. And, and it's a complicated question, but, uh, you know, we should, we should stop um, thinking about these other countries in the way we did when the immense broad-based bipartisan consensus that America should lead the world on reducing the immense barriers to trade after World War II it would be good for everybody, including the U.S. Yes, access yes. to U.S. markets is more important to the other countries than us to them. But generally, we all prospered together. But um, the, the world has changed a lot since then. It's changed a lot since uh, since China joined the WTO. And the WTO has been proved to be a pretty creepy organization. And so it's unclear how we're going to be able to have a, a better trade relationship with China Um in some of these key areas, from intellectual property theft and some other things. Yeah. I mean, it's great they want to, they, they, they pledged to buy some more U.S. agricultural yeah, products and bought some of them, but just in general. And the last thing I would say, it's important to understand uh -huh. that there's, there's a big misunderstanding about the U.S. trade deficit, which focuses on unfair practices in other, <coughs> pardon me, in other countries. But <coughs> actually, it's mostly due to the, dis, uh, to the difference between our production and our consumption in the United States. It's, it's basically the saving investment imbalance macroeconomically that has its mirror image, uh, our current account deficit. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't be dealing with these problems. It doesn't mean we should try to deal with them in a uh, quickly, but in a civil and constructive way to the extent we can. But I, I just don't think it's gonna be easy um, to manage this relationship in a constructive way that will yield uh, large results quickly. I think that would be, um, that there may be some agreements made, but we'll see if they actually pan out. I think it's, I think it's a very, very deep structural problem inside China, politically and economically, and not easily, not easily changed given the <laughs> Communist Party's desire to maintain a very strong control over the economy. And their very large control over many businesses, which may be listed on the, on the stock exchange, but still have a majority of uh, state ownership. Sure, sure. So, and, and so can I just? Uh, uh, I don't. I don't want to. I just want to add a few uh, sort of additional in remarks on this. I. I think that look, the Europeans just negotiated a foreign direct investment deal with China. China just had. All of the Asian economies, including uh, South Korea, including Japan, sign up to their RCEP, their regional trade agreement. Uh, there is room for the U.S. to negotiate with China to liberalize some trade and liberalize some foreign direct investment. We haven't done it. We focused on the U.S. alone. We basically focused on that trade deficit, which, as Michael said, was the wrong measure of the relationship anyway. We didn't even use the WTO. You know, we did not. We had the right, when we wrote our own rules for getting China into the WTO, we had the right to do a lot of adjustment assistance for those communities and firms in the United States that were hit by the China import surge that occurred. We didn't do anything. We didn't do it. That was our decision. That was our decision. So I think we should, yes, I completely agree, agree that Xi is taken, he's taken China in a, in a different direction. There's more state control, not less. By the way, I think we should all recognize that from China's point of view, when, when did this start to happen? It started to happen when the Western capitalist systems caved in the Great Recession. We brought that on. They saw the they saw the, the 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 vulnerabilities of the capitalist financial system play out to a multi year recession, and they were able to use their own stimulus policy, their own protection from those capital markets disruptions to continue to grow. I, you know, think about it from their perspective for a minute. They they can't see all the obvious things that are wrong with their system that we impose on them. Do they, you know, and 
I, I guess I want to add here just the point. I've read a lot of Bill Hasseltine, who's a p- professor and one of the p- one of the public health experts who's been you you the the ability of China to handle COVID has been dramatic. It's been dramatic, and nobody's willing to take the lessons from it because the United States is like oh it's 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 China strategy. It's the way China does things. We can't possibly learn from that. No, we could learn from that. So I I, I want to say that. I think we should not work with our allies. This is where I completely agree with Michael. We, we have an opportunity to work with our allies in Asia and to work with our allies in Europe to negotiate uh, better trade relations with China, both trade and foreign direct investment, and we should do it. We should do it. So. I, I agree with some of what Laura said. I would say, however that I don't think Americans are ready to sign up for a regime where if they don't immediately sign up for their vaccination, where they don't stay in their home 24 by 7, that they can be arrested or they can have their scores change on they, their... They may not, Michael. So I think I think that what's important is for people to just understand then. I th- yes, I agree. We may decide we, we have a different trade-off, a different system. But I think there are some lessons we might learn. I mean, just the way they handle quarantine going in and into China. There, there are lessons that we might learn. So that's all. I, yep. Yep. And unfortunately, it wasn't symmetric. They kept people from leaving Wuhan inside China, but sent them here in Europe. But besides that, I would, I would just say, I think the more general point that Laura is making is that Americans, because of our economic hegemony and military hegemony, at least since World War II, uh, haven't uh, haven't paid enough attention to putting themselves in the other guy's foot uh, shoes, yeah. walking around a little bit and understanding their perspective. I agree. The rest of the world is kind of, you know, we've led, they've mostly followed, you know, <laughs> the Europeans agree. worried about an invasion over the, uh, over the German plane from r- Russian tanks. So they kind of listen to us now. They don't worry about that. So they don't listen to us, but just in general, it'd be a good idea if we tried to understand everybody else. And that, that includes our education system. Yes, yeah, completely agree. <laughs> I'd, I'd go back to two questions then, um, to finish up on the global Brexit. Now that they have an agreement, how does that affect us? Um, very modestly. <laughs> There'll be yeah. some trade diversion. Um, you know, we may or may not wind up negotiating a treaty with the Brits. Um, and, uh, but, but I do think that Brexit is part of a very larger global trend that relates mm-hmm. to some of the things we're seeing. Uh, which is uh, a tremendous growth in in two things. One, a growth in the tensions among different levels of government. You know, we're all citizens of a city, a state, a country, and you know the world, obviously. But um, so, uh, in the Brexit case between a sovereign nation and a supranational identity uh, organization, the EU, but then they had Scottish dev- Scottish devolution and attempt. A vote on secession. There may be another one so they can join the EU. You have the Catalans, you have Venice and the Veneto saying they might exit. We've had Cal exit desires off and on in, the, in California for many years intensified during the Trump presidency. Um, and, uh, and we have a lot of those same tensions here among different levels of government. We have different areas of different states with different laws because on the one hand, cities and states have declared themselves sanctuary states, don't cooperate with ICE. And some of the, some of the towns in those mm-hmm. states said, we're going to cooperate with the federal government out the state laws. Same thing with these gun banning laws and the Second Amendment free zones and places and other c- cities and states and c- cities inside those states saying, we're not going to go along with the state rules. So um, one of the things that would be really, really good for American democracy would be to get a better a better sense of clarity about uh, responsibilities and resources and rights among, between our national government and our subnational governments. Mm-hmm. So, what, one of the things, though, I I completely agree, and as you probably may or may not know, for many years in uh, during the Trump administration. I was working a lot on sort of a federalism and the notion of what states can do. Uh, if they want to build up their, say they want to strengthen their social safety net, or they want to strengthen their community college system, or they want to strengthen their worker training system. And by the way, um, 
not all of this is in a, a progressive, and I'll use the word progressive here, state like California. If you, stay, if you take a state like Indiana, for example, um, a lot of really interesting training stuff has gone on at the level of the state because people look to the state governments for a lot of economic development issues, and those are related to talent issues and to training issues. So right. I, I do think that that the federalism of the United States is actually a, a tremendous strength um, of this of the U.S. system. I think the problem is when you have a think about I I have thought about COVID from the beginning as the best analogy is it's a war it's a war with a virus it's a war with a living thing that's a virus okay and in a war setting you actually need a national response. You actually need the Defense Production Act. You actually need FEMA. You actually need a distribution. You know, the one of the things that President Biden is proposing now, and I can't imagine why we haven't said this before, we're going to have to set up major vaccination centers. We are going to have to have them, some of them be mobile to get to places in states that where there is no vaccination center. So I think we have to say that there are certain times you have a national challenge and the national challenge requires a national solution. Um, on the issue of infrastructure, let's go there because I do think we, we know that national surveys uh, consistently rank infrastructure as subpar in many parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. We do know that. We also know that the selection for programs is oftentimes led at the state level or the municipality level. I completely agree with the notion of making sure we're doing cost benefit analysis. And by the way, I think Michael, I believe, uh, maybe there's someone in the audience who can attest to this, that when the high-speed rail proposal was made. It was made with cost-benefit analysis. The cost change, the benefits change, it turns out it's not the right thing, okay? I, but, but I don't think that people making that decision were saying, I don't care about cost-benefit, it doesn't matter to me, I just want to do this. I just think that's really not fair. I mean, these are massive multi-year investment projects and maybe as you're going through them, you see, okay, I got to make an adjustment. I got to scale this back. I got to do it this way. Um, so I, I, I guess we're always going to have a very important role of state and local governments in infrastructure, and that is correct. And I believe that uh, we should make sure that our state and local governments, when they do that, have cost benefit analysis in mind. I mean, you mentioned high speed rail. You know, one of the, I just gay, I think, uh, one of the places where infrastructure projects get a big A plus in the state of California is Los Angeles. Much of the work, much of the infrastructure projects going on in Los Angeles, people view. I mean, it's basically public transport. It's basically to get people moving around in this in a city which was never built up to move people around. So I, th th that's all I guess. Uh, when you have a COVID crisis, though, it's got to be ultimately a federal response. Well, of course, there was a federal response. It was uneven. It was imperfect. And you can argue how much Trump got him, you know, did right and wrong and so on. I don't want to get involved in that. No, I think but but in, in fact, in fact, the Defense Production Act was engaged. FEMA did set up hospitals in New York. Uh, so we need more. Obviously, greatly overreacted. He needed 10% of the ventilators he demanded, et cetera. In California, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger had built built up the supply of PPE and ventilators after the previous cri uh, health crisis, and they were just left to sit around. And uh, so we had to actually have them re have the ventilators repaired by Bloom Energy. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, you know there was just this basic lack of attention to that level of the basic aspects of uh, of government. Uh, I'd also say California. We haven't talked about it, and everyone talks about infrastructure in terms of uh, this or that success or horror story. But one of the real tragedies is that California has horribly underinvested over the recent decades as its population has doubled in water storage capacity. Mm. And we're yes. about to have another drought. And, yes, uh, we're in a drought. Uh, and on we're top of all the other things that have been visited yep. on the nation in California, yep. a lot of Californians are going to start feeling like Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So um, we got a compliment from our audience. Why can't leaders on different sides of the aisle get along as well as you do when it comes to discussing economic views? And then the, the question then becomes, so what can economists, what role can they play in any reconciliation between Trump supporters and the Biden administration? So I want to start by saying that I'm not surprised. You know, Michael left the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and I became the chair. And I inherited his staff, the the economists he had chosen to work on issues. They were fabulous. I worked really well with them. Some of them have remained my friends over many (laughs) years. So there is uh, economists there's a large amount of things that people really agree upon. Even in this discussion of fiscal space we had, um, Michael said, we've got to spend now. We, 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 we have to spend now. We should spend now. We should make it targeted, have the most effect, you know, look at the, look at what we're spending on, but we are going to need to spend. And we, we need to keep in mind that in the future, that is building up debt, and then we're going to have to think about the implications, what what to do about that, what to do about that. So economists agree on on all of these things. I think a real problem here is that so much of the, the, is the political division and the ideological division. Mm -hmm. This is not about, and I'll use the, the over the loaded term now, this is not about facts. It is not about facts. It is about ideology. So uh, there's already some signaling from some of the Republican senators. Okay, we're, we don't want to spend on any of this. We don't, we, we, we just don't. We don't, we think the government is too big. The government shouldn't be doing this sort of thing, the government. And when you ask them why, it's not because they might not agree. They might agree. Yeah, there's a real problem of people not being able to get jobs, and therefore we should extend the unemployment compensation. But you know, we really shouldn't give money to state and local governments. And so basically, we're just going to oppose the whole thing uh, because we think government is too big, or government shouldn't be doing this. So I'm saddened by the fact that it's the political divide and the ideological divide behind that political divide that leads to a disagreement on policy. Whereas the economist, I've been struck by the bipartisan agreements among economists on the stimulus package, on the monetary, on the, on the need to invest in climate change, on the need to invest in infrastructure. Those, th- th- there's not much disagreement at all among economists on those issues. Those are big, big issues, but there's going to be disagreement and it's going to be political and it's going to be ideological. And that is tragic. It's tragic for the country because we'd like, and I I give President Biden full mark. He he wants to try to not push all this through reconciliation. He wants to get a bipartisan agreement on these things. That's what he wants to do. He may fail because the political and ideological divides he won't be able to bridge. I don't know. But uh, that's how I would answer your question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I like to start with those divides are within party as well as across party politically. And I would just say, while I mostly agree with Laura, economists do have their disagreements. They read evidence differently. They wait. Uh, actually, most of us weight our own studies probably more heavily than other people's studies. <laughs> Natural human uh, behavior. Uh, probably too much confirmation bias, but we disagree. Um, but the bounds of disagreement are conducted in a professional scientific debate. How did okay. you come to this conclusion? Well, did you, you know, if we change this assumption, yeah. look at this data, we get a different conclusion. And of course, many, many of the important issues in economics, we don't get a very clean natural experiment like you get in the in the natural sciences. So we can't run the counterfactual. What would have happened if the Fed had had a less uh, had, had spent had quickly removed its mm-hmm. backstops after things stabilized. We don't know what could have happened. We can conjecture. We can worry about it. We can say the Fed stayed on too long or needs to stay on longer. But those that's kind of the range of those things. We generally agree that restrictions to trade are not good, but at times they're necessary to deal with certain issues. We generally agree that uh, you know if we spend, we generally want to spend on things that actually have some sort of a payoff. I think it was mentioned earlier that. Uh, some of these uh, just 
broad-based checks to people were heavily saved. Uh, they also just, you know, sending them to a, fa- you know, to a couple with $150,000 income that didn't lose their job uh, and is probably spending less now is, is kind of what uh, gives you a hint of what Laura and I are both saying. We need to target these people who really need it, who actually might okay. spend either for humanitarian purposes, they're in desperate shape, or they actually might spend it. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of issues like that. And there's a lot of issues going back and looking at the past. You know, I've been closely associated with the fact that I think that President Obama contributes far from, you know, he inherited a deep recession. It wasn't all his fault. And I don't want to get into a big political argument. But part of the reason that the economy moved slowly was he decided in the midst of all that to, totally, to try to totally re-engineer huge swaths of the economy. You can argue whether that was a good or bad idea, but I suggested ex ante, and when the New York Times asked me to give him advice the week after the election, that he put those on hold till the economy started to recover. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that that contributed to the slow recovery. And you could say the same thing that some people believe that the Trump trade policy slowed down what would have been a stronger uh, effect of other aspects of it. So that, that's the range. I'm using that to illustrate, not to say that I'm right or wrong about mm-hmm. any of mm-hmm. On the yeah. political divide, however, what has really happened is the following, in, in my view. Number one, uh, there has been, uh, f- since the 60s, and it started right here in California with Jess Unruh, who was head of the legislature, uh, the scientific gerrymandering of districts. And the courts have tried to modulate a little bit, but basically most people running for office are worried about uh, their ba- someone from their extreme base running against them, uh, and they have to adhere to that. Uh, so there's, there are fewer people in the middle uh, than there used to be. Uh, and secondly, uh, we have media and social media. Uh, media has reverted to its uh, traditional role prior to the last, uh, maybe the decades from the, you know, in the early post-war period of being quite partisan. And social media has accentuated that. And the math of social media is particularly horrible in this regard, particularly mm-hmm. damaging. The mm-hmm. way you get retweeted or go yeah. viral to say something extreme. Laura and I having a conversation is going to get far fewer viewers than if we were <laughs> screaming at the top of our lungs at each other, threatening to pull each other's hair out. Well, in my case, she had have, have an easier job than I would. <laughs> in any event, uh, so, right. so that really highlights the, vo- the voices that get amplified the most in today's sphere, since a lot yeah. of traditional media is, amp- is responding to this stuff. And politicians to get to their audiences are choosing to use social media a lot, uh, tends to be of this uh, very extreme view. I have a colleague, Mo Fiorino, who studied opinions, and most of the countries somewhere in the center left, center, center, uh, center right. right. They're not at the extremes. The Democratic Party, the reason Joe Biden was a nominee and is now president, is he was the moderate running. Mm-hmm. He was center yeah. left, not moderate in old, in old language, center. He was center left and he made some accommodations left. You might say that was clever politics, but he, he was not uh, uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And the, if the data show that 60 to 65 percent of Democrats consider themselves center left, not further left, not so-called progressive. Uh-huh. And that's number one. And actually among minorities, which are a very important part of the base and help Biden over the line, it's much larger. Uh-huh. Um, and uh-huh. the same uh-huh. in the Republican, the Republicans. And of course, all these things splinter, you know, the progressive yep. splinter, the center left splinter, the center and right, right, and the right splinter. There are many different types of conservatives and liberals. I mean, parties are basically amalgamations of factions and that those change over time. Trump and to some extent, Bernie Sanders rejiggered those coalitions a bit. Um, but they're, but they're aggregations of those. We all have many interests. We wear many hats. But can I, I, just, I, I agree with everything. And by the way, that center, that 60% is sort of where the economists are. So basically, I would say that basically the fact that they're, but well, I, I just want to I'd raise say, I'd say 80 or 90% of the economists. <laughs> Maybe 80 or 90% of the economists are right there in the center someplace. But I do want to raise something that I, so I agree in gerrymandering. I want to raise the money in politics and, and Citizens United, which has totally changed. It, it so feeds into the gerrymandering social media thing. It's just like one vicious cycle there, I think, that I worry a lot about. I also do worry about the fact, and this was very well documented in the book by uh, Ezra Klein, now quite a progressive thinker, so I understand that. Uh, uh, but but he w- was really pointing out 
that as identity politics have grown in the United States, and that could be identity with your religion, identity with your with your church, identity with your 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 very your your very small neighborhood, that what's happened here is that the people who are serving in the Congress are actually quite divorced from the issues that people care about. So majority of Americans like a minimum wage. A majority of Americans are very concerned about uh, gun safety and, and, and gun control. A majority of Americans uh, came to believe, absolutely believe, and this was the worst concern of the Republicans who were opposed it, that health care is a right. Health care is something that the government should provide. So basically, people want things from their elected officials, that their elected officials are actually unwilling to move on, in part because of the, the ways, of the, the, the ideological identity fervor, which is actually divorced from issues yeah. themselves. That's right. all I would say. Right. Right. Unfortunately, thank you so much. We've actually run out of time and we're over time for this great conversation that we've having. I'd like to thank Dr. Michael Boskin, the Tully M. Friedman Professor of Economics and Wolfold Family Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, who chaired President George H.W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, and Dr. Laura Tyson, Distinguished Professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California in Berkeley, who chaired President Bill Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. Thank you so much for an enlightening conversation. And we also thank our audience today. Today's program has been sponsored by the Walter E. Hoadley Memorial Fund and Bank of America. I'm Evelyn Dilsaver, Chair of the Commonwealth Club of Board of Governors, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Nice to see you again. Nice to meet you, Evelyn. Bye. <laughs>